Hello everyone. Welcome to this video discussion on introduction to the history of the English language. So before I proceed to discussing the origin and the influences of the English language, let me first introduce all of you to what English language is all about. Language is a fundamental human faculty used for the expression of our thoughts and creative ideas face-to-face, -face, communication, scientific inquiry, and many other purposes. Now, we know language is very valuable because it allows us to communicate effectively with other people. In the absence of language, we may not be able to express our ideas and emotions to other people or the other people whom we have relationships with. Also, it is very important to understand that language is here to help us progress on a daily basis. Another thing is that most humans are born with the ability to acquire language automatically and effortlessly if provided the right input by their environment. Well, we also need to take into consideration that we also have these humans who are not automatically capable to learn the language primarily because they suffer from various language or brain disorders. Now, these disorders limit them from learning or acquiring a language. And it has also been said that there is an estimated 6,000 to 7,000 languages in the world. Imagine the vast array of languages spoken across nations. Well, it has also to be noted that among this 6,000 to 7,000 languages spoken in the world, there are also those which are already dying, primarily because of the advancement of technology or perhaps the challenges with the current generation in terms of the usage of these languages. And apart, apart from that, it's also important that we know how to understand or distinguish language from dialects. So just to give you a glimpse, a language is a widely spoken yeah, language by different nations, whereas dialects are specific languages or means of communication used for specific geographical locations only. But what matters most here is that we need to understand that language is used for mutual intelligibility. We use language, for example, in a specific speech community because we know that the symbols and codes present in that language could be used for us to understand each other, for us to achieve intelligibility. And another interesting thing is that we use language as our primary tool to express our emotions, ideas, or thoughts within that speech community. And that language is only exclusive within that speech community to be understood. Well, it is true that we have already a number of sociolects, okay, dialects spoken by a specific social group. And these sociolects have been widely used also by those people outside their speech community. It is just nice to ponder that mutual intelligibility still exists despite the fact that some people use the sociolects of other people coming from other speech communities. It is because we humans are actually, we actually have this mechanism to really understand languages and adapt in a given situation. So that is language and mutual intelligibility. Now the number of languages is decreasing rapidly as some language disappear and a few others become widespread. So as what I mentioned, there are also dying languages. And there are also languages that have already died. Okay? So we have languages that have already gone extinction. So these are the languages that really need to be rescued. They need to be revitalized so that the number of speakers of these languages could be doubled as what we have right now. And then we also have widely spoken languages across the globe. So we have Chinese or Mandarin, which is considered to be the business language. Okay? And then you also have English. Um, most of the time, this is considered to be the lingua franca, okay, the universal language that we speak. We also have Spanish, which has had a number of influences on the different languages across the globe. For example, the Filipino language. And then you also have the Indonesian language or the Bahasa Indonesia. And you also have the Hindi, spoken primarily in Indian regions. Now, the language gift that is in it in us is not English or indeed any specific language. We cannot really say that the English language is already innate. Okay? 
it doesn't necessarily mean that once a person is very good in speaking the language, he or she has already this mechanism built in his or her brain which allows that person to speak the language fluently. It's not like that. It is instead the ability to learn and to use a human language. Why do we have all this ability? Simply because our brain is structured that way. We have hemispheres which take charge in language production, acquisition, and processing. And because of these cortical regions in our brain, we are now enabled to learn or acquire a language and to use it in our day-to-day -day conversation or communication. But the question here is, even if we have already fully understood that we have this built-in mechanism to learn the language, why is still there a need for us to study the history of the English language? So here are some reasons. First one is that language in general is an ability inherent in us. And understanding what is innate will also help us understand why and how we produce language. And we can know also the underlying ability only through studying the actual languages that are its expressions. So we cannot really fully say that we are capable of speaking a language unless we carefully study the mechanisms utilized in speaking such a language. Thus, one of the best reasons for studying languages is to find out about ourselves, about what makes us truly human. This may sound philosophical, but this is one good way for us also to understand why there is a need for us to study the history of the English language. This is specifically true not only in English. We may also consider studying the history of other languages as it may also reflect our culture. For example, in our case, the Filipino language. The moment that we study the origin of the Filipino language, then we could also understand the culture of the Philippines, of the country itself, and its people. So, studying languages could be one best platform for us to understand not only the culture, but also the people in a specific nation. Now, the best place to start such a study is through the most influential language, English. Why is English considered to be influential? Now, we all know that English language is considered as the lingua franca or the universal language. It's the universal language primarily because it's the language widely spoken by different nationalities. Most especially if the goal here is to reach understanding between cultures or nations. So this time, let me discuss to you the necessity to study historically. The okay, first one is to understand how things are. It is often helpful and sometimes essential to know how they got to be that way, right? So whenever we have something, okay, or whenever we hear about, let's say, an interesting story, we are also very interested about learning how it all started. And so it's also important that we study the history of the English language for us to appreciate more the English language that we are using at present. It's also one good way for us to understand the many irregularities in today's language. Now, we notice that there are some oddities, there are some inconsistencies with the patterns of language use. And I think all of us are also aware that language is pretty dynamic. And so we could really expect that from time to time, there could be some, several changes with the language itself and its usage in the community. And these irregularities, I should say, is also considered to be remnants of earlier quite regular patterns. So through that, we understand not only the present language, but also its older version. And we could also have that appreciation of what really happened in the past and how it helped or impacted the evolution of the English language through times. Another thing is that because we're talking about the irregularities, maybe we can consider this one. For example, The last um, syllables or sounds underlined here may form the word fish when read. Okay, so we have enough the f sound, and then we have the women, e sound, the first vowel sound in the word, and then we also have a nation, the consonant sh sound. Okay, so if you look at it, these are actually pronounced when combined as fish. However, if we spell it, we have here the word gotti. Okay. 
So this is an example of an irregularity in the English language. For example, when we use the GH sound at the last syllable of the word, it's read as F. Okay? It carries the F sound. However, once it's used already, okay, on the first syllable, we do not pronounce it or we do not articulate it anymore as an F sound. Okay? It starts with G and H. So this word could be read as goti and not foti. Okay? However, once we spell it, this one can be read as fish. Okay, this is just an example, but if you check the dictionary, this word actually does not exist. Okay? So again, these are the reasons why there is a need for us to study historically. Third one is for us to also understand the literature of earlier times. Now, we know that there have been a number of literary artworks and masterpieces that were done by great authors before. Okay? And in order for us to appreciate their works, I think it's also, it will also matter that we know something about the old English language. Okay? For example, the works of Shakespeare. We cannot truly appreciate the language used by William Shakespeare in his sonnets, for example, if we would not really understand as well the old English language pat patterns. So through that, we can also appreciate more the literature of earlier times. Now, there have been a lot of meanings when we talk about the English language. Okay, so if you, uh, you cross-check literature, a lot of meanings or definitions are provided for the English language. Okay? But one thing we need to remember is that the English language is Germanic in origin. Later on, I will be showing you the language family tree so that you could also trace the origin of the English language as to what its mother language is. Okay. And then we could also say that some words in the English language are heavily influenced by French and Latin languages. Now, the Latin language may be considered already as a dead language for some, but we could see the remnants of Latin language in several literary pieces, or if not several pieces of, for example, um, readings that we have, such as Bible and the law that we use or implement nowadays. All of these, okay, the words used there, the English words there, were primarily heavy, or were heavily every, were heavily impacted by French and Latin influences. Okay. So there are two ways on how we could define the English language. First one is by defining it through its origins and history. So we can truly understand what English language is once we go back to its origins and historical data. The second one is by looking at a comparison with other languages. Okay, what are the similarities of the English language and other languages that we have right now? And we can also look at the distinction between the stages of the evolution of the English language and the stages of the evolution of the rest of the languages. And we could also understand the English language through the lens of its very own stages. For example, from before Old English period to the Old English, to the Middle English, up to now, we have the Modern English. So by looking at these perspectives, we can definitely have an idea what the English language is all about. Okay, this time I'll give you a briefer on the origins and history of the English language. So this part is very important because this will help you have an idea on how the English language originated and how it evolved through times. Now, if we look at this language family tree, we can see here that this one is the um, language tree. Okay, the language tree, which will help us see the mother language here, which is Proto-Indo-European. And then if we trace it here, we can actually see that this one, Okay, from Proto-Indo-European language down to Germanic, and then Germanic language could be subdivided into three sub-languages. We have the West Germanic, the East Germanic, and the North Germanic. Below West Germanic, we could classify two more languages as Low German or High German. But English is located or categorized below or under rather the Low German language, okay, together with Frisian 
modern law um, German, the Old Dutch, Dutch, Flemish, and the Afrikaans languages. Okay, so this is a closer look where we could really see that English is under the category of Germanic, Western Germanic languages. And you also have here the specific anglo frisian language, which is also the origin of the English language. Okay, so that's how we trace it. Now, the British Isles have been inhabited by different people for a long time. They say that the British Isles were, uh, the British Isles was actually a land of amalgamated cultures. It was a hot pot of different kinds of cultures. And it was also inhabited by people coming from different places. Early humans, or we call this, them as hominids, were present possibly 500,000 years ago in what we know, what we now call England, okay? So these hominids were assumed not to have had language. So before, we know that there was really no means of communication except for some stone carvings that we had. And these hominids um, may have continued to live there until the Ice Age or the extinction of human beings. After the Ice Age, humans again start to occupy Britain around 10,000 years ago and 5,000 years ago sees the construction of the Stonehenge. Okay. And we also have a Pictish, who may have been spoken by the ancestors. So Pictish is also a group of people residing beside or near the, this place, the British Isles. And then 3,000 years ago, the Celts came or arrived in the British Isles. Celts encountered the Pictish speakers with whom they had communication or conversation and therefore, Celtic languages were widely spoken all over Europe, and there were many tribes, and some migrated to England and Great Britain. And one of these tribes may have been given a name such as Britanni, from which the names Britain and British may have been derived. Okay? Now, the Celts in Britain came into contact with the Romans in Latin when the Romans came to Britain 2,000 years or more ago. It is actually with this close contact that other cultures learned about another language. Okay, for example, when, they, when these Celts in Britain met the Romans in the Latin, then definitely some of um, the words in the Roman and Latin languages might have been borrowed okay, or used by the Celts when conversing with people. For example, we have here words like wall, kitchen, wine, mine, and street, which are all examples of borrowed or loan words from Latin into Germanic, which also came into English via Germanic. And then English officially starts when the Germanic tribes and then languages reached the British Isles in 449 BC. And because of this, there is now this proliferation with the use of the English language. The word English derives from one of these tribes, the Angles. So if you go back to the language family tree, you can see there that anglo frisian is primarily the prototype language of the English language. So it's, um, English is found under um, the Proto-Anglo-Frisian uh, language. Okay, so if you could see here, this map here shows the migration of the different cultures going to the British Isles. So there is no wonder why the British Isles has or had a language which was very unique, primarily because it was composed of different kinds of languages. See, we have the Jutes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Frisians who migrated to British. And this migration also contributed to the features of the current language in the British Isles. Now, what started as a Germanic dialect spoken in a small part of England is now a language spoken by over a billion people in many parts of the world. It's either as English as a first or second language. And English has adopted a large number of words from other languages. So you notice a while ago that there is also a good number of loan words from Latin. Okay? It is also estimated that half of the vocabulary of the English language comes from French and Latin. Now, if you check the dictionary and look at the lexicography there, you could see that some of the words there, if not all, are or have rather French and Latin origin. Okay? Now let's ponder on this. This is actually an article analyzed by Lutz entitled Double Speak. Okay? This was published in 1990. This one is titled Involuntary Conversions, Preemptive Counterattacks, and Incomplete It's Incomplete Successes, The World of Double Speak. 
And for those who have no idea what double speak is, double speak is actually a language, okay, a word or a statement which suggests double meaning. Okay, that means the implied the, the meaning is not explicitly stated based on the utterance or the statement. Let's have this one. There are no potholes in the streets of Tucson, Arizona, just pavement deficiencies. So this is an example of a double speak. Instead of saying potholes, um, pavement deficiencies is used. The administration didn't propose any new taxes, just revenue enhancement through the new user's fees. Those aren't bumps in the street. They're just called non-goal-oriented members of the society. There are no more poor people, just fiscal underachievers. There was no robbery of, any, um, of an automatic teller machine, just an authorized, unauthorized withdrawal. The patient didn't die because of medical malpractice. It was just a diagnostic misadventure of a high magnitude. And then the U.S. Army doesn't kill the enemy anymore. It's just services to target. And the double speak goes on. See, there are a lot of double speak present in this paragraph alone. Now, why am I presenting this one? Because these paragraphs tell us a lot about the evolution of the English language. If we notice, there were older versions of statements used before. However, double speak has come to rise, and these double speak statements have been widely used by people to cover what is not actually pleasing to the ears. Later on, I'll show you some. Uh, more examples. Okay, so here are the observations of William Lutz in his um, article titled Double Speak. The most frequent words are native. For example, the use of these determiners, the, a, and an, the use of the auxiliary did, okay, use a pronoun it, and use a preposition of. Um, we could also say that affixations are also native. Um, there were inflectional morphine s and also the inflectional morphine S for third-person singular. Okay, the text is also extreme in the number of French and Latin loan words. As mentioned a while ago, there are a number of French and Latin loan words present in the article. As a matter of fact, almost half of the words are borrowings from French, Latin, and other languages. Now, many of these borrowings are also euphemisms. And when you say euphemisms, these are statements which are used to conceal the negative message Okay, so for example, instead of saying um, elevator man, we say the lift operator. Okay, instead of saying janitors, we say sanitary engineers. Now, these are euphemisms, okay, meaning we try to conceal the, negatively, uh, the negative label for a person, an event, or an idea and replace it with a word that is more pleasing to the ears. Okay, so... Let's have this table. This table shows you the frequency of words found in the article uh, analyzed by William Lutz. So if you see, we have Old English here with a total percentage of 32, French 45, Latin 17, other Germanic languages, we have four, and other languages too. Now we also have here statistical data showing you the first, second, and third 1,000 most frequent words and their origins. So the first 1,000, I think the dominant here is Old English language. And then for the next 2,000, the most dominant here is French. Same is true with the next 3,000. Okay. Now, why is it very important to look at this as a source of meaningful data? Primarily because this tells us a lot about the dominance of the Old English language in the texts. Okay. We might not be able to notice it that we are already using this Old English statements. Okay, so we need to be aware as well as to the usage of the Old English language, most especially in modern write-ups. Now, to end this, let me just remind you that even if we know all the words in the Oxford English Dictionary, we still would not know the English language itself. Yes, we may have some ideas about the words that you can find in the Oxford English Dictionary. But that is not a guarantee to tell that you are really knowledgeable, fully knowledgeable of the English language. When you say full knowledge of the English language, you need to take into consideration not only its grammar and mechanics, but also its history or origin so that you could really understand those people who are using the English language as either their first or second language. Okay? We also need rules to put the words together into sentences. That's why we covered by grammar. Now, grammar generates language, okay? The structure of the sounds, which involve 
involves phonetics and phonology. We also have words, which is morphology, sentences. We also have syntax here. And the rules for understanding the meanings of semantics and appropriate use or pragmatics. Now, it's very important that we also understand the history of the English language so that we can also understand the different linguistic features of this language. For example, why is it sounded like this when added in to this syllable and then once read, it already becomes totally different. Okay, cases like this will allow you to really look at the history of the English language and trace how it all started or how it all began. Okay, so I hope you have understood something from this discussion. So if you have further questions about this talk on the history of the English language, specifically on the introduction to the English language itself, you are free to post your questions in the open forum. Thank you very much.